All right, so in this presentation, I am going to talk uh, about some approaches for teaching shear analysis and design of reinforced concrete. I'm filling in for Matthew Lovell uh, from Rose Holman on this one. Um, and then our other co-authors on this paper uh, were Ben Diamond, who's here, uh, and Ken Hover from Cornell. Uh, so thanks to those guys for all their work on this paper. Again, I get to do the fun part. Uh, they put in all the work. Uh, so kind of like what we've talked about uh, in these previous you know, presentations, uh, it's not just the content. Uh, we're all experts in the content, but how it's delivered. Uh, and we've talked a lot about learning styles uh, and you know, our need for some guidance uh, as we go into teaching from a PhD program. Uh, and so we're looking at that for sheer uh, in concrete one in this presentation. Uh, so in terms of just kind of a short summary of the technical content on shear behavior, you know, we're looking at Shear behavior in a concrete beam is really a combination of flexural, axial, and shear stresses uh, acting together on a beam. And so if we say, look at that for this cantilever beam here, uh, we have you know, all those stresses uh, acting on the beam. Uh, they cause uh, principal stresses that create tension. Uh, tension and concrete are not friends. Uh, so we get a diagonal uh, tension failure uh, that's rapid, uh, very brittle failure, uh, which is not you know, what we typically want in a uh, concrete beam. Uh, so we use a smaller fee factor for shear of 0.75 uh, and for non-pre-stressed elements, which is what we're talking about here, uh, we're going to have those cracks occur at a 45 degree angle, um, which is based on those principal stresses. So our overall design philosophy uh, is to estimate the strength uh, that results in cracking in shear, uh, as well as our kind of post-cracking strength, uh, which is included in our concrete contribution. Uh, and then we're going to cross uh, those cracks uh, with shear stirrups uh, that may change over the length of the beam depending on the shear demand. So in terms of shear design, uh, we want our design shear strength VVN to be greater than uh, our ultimate applied shear V sub U. Uh, and we're going to take our nominal shear strength as a combination of the con concrete contribution V sub C and steel contribution V sub S. Uh, our ultimate shear force V sub U uh, is going to be based on the shear diagram. Uh, it's going to change along the length depending on the type of loading that we have. Uh, and uh, we're going to take our maximum V sub U based on the force at a distance of D from the support if we have typical supports uh, and use that to design uh, that in region of our beam. Uh, so in terms of the concrete contribution uh, to shear, uh, there were some changes in 318.19 uh, in the shear equations. Um, that's one of the things, you know, when you're teaching a course that's code based, you always have to keep up with the, the newest codes so that you know what changes are out there so you can, you know, relay that information to the students. Uh, but in 2019, uh, they included a size effect factor for sections without a minimum amount of reinforcement. Uh, and also move to multiple equations that account for that presence of minimum reinforcement. Uh, if we look at kind of a graph of that size effect factor, uh, it comes into play when our effective depth is greater than 10 inches. Uh, and this graph only goes out to 60 inches, uh, but it's applicable beyond that. Uh, but we can see that we have uh, a decrease uh, in that size factor and a resulting decrease in strength uh, as the depth of our section increases uh, if we don't have that minimum reinforcement. If we do have minimum reinforcement, our concrete contribution is going to be a function of our uh, concrete compressive strength, uh, axial force, um, the width of our web B sub W and our effective depth D. Uh, if we have no axial force, uh, this first equation will default back to the two square root of F prime C uh, that we're probably all used to seeing um, from our undergraduate onward. Uh, but if you're just starting out teaching, you might not have seen that before. Uh, and so there are you know, several different equations that come into play uh, in terms of calculating shear capacity. Uh, if we don't have a minimum shear reinforcement, uh, then we're going to use our V sub C equation of 8 times lambda S, which is our size factor, times lambda times rho W to the one-third square root of F prime C uh, plus N sub U or our axial force divided by 6 AG uh, times V sub W times D. So as we're presenting this material, it's important to make sure the students know what that notation means. Uh, where you know D is our effective depth, B sub W is our web width, uh, F prime C is our concrete compressive strength in PSI. Um, you know, it's always important to emphasize to the students it goes into the square root in PSI, it comes out in PSI, it's almost like magic. Uh, and then lambda is our modification factor uh, to account for properties of lightweight concrete, uh, which also had a slight change in the 2019 ACI code. 
Uh, that lambda sub s factor is included here as the square root of two over one plus d over 10, where d is our effective depth uh, and that factor is less than or equal to one. So if d is uh, less than 10, that factor is not going to apply. Uh, in terms of our steel contribution, you know, we usually include uh, vertical stirrups, um, potentially in multiple different configurations, uh, depending on our geometry. Uh, and we'll calculate our steel contribution of V sub S equal to AV times FY uh, times D over S, which is based on the force in our stirrups that are crossing a crack that's at 45 degrees. In terms of determining the required stirrups, uh, we can take our ultimate uh, applied factored shear force V sub U, set that equal to uh, our design force uh, from the concrete plus the steel, uh, if we have no axial force and a minimum amount of reinforcement, we can simplify V sub C to that two lambda squared of F prime C B W D. Uh, and we can use that to solve for our stirrup spacing. Uh, if we develop our V sub U uh, as an equation uh, in terms of distance along the length of our beam, we can solve for spacing uh, in terms of distance along the length of our beam. Uh, however, we usually take this as a stepwise approach and design different regions uh, for stirrup spacing along the length of our beam. And then of course, going back to detailing, we have to consider the minimums uh, in terms of minimum steel, maximum spacing, uh, cover, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so we looked at the four universities that were represented by the authors of our paper uh, in terms of what topics were covered relative to shear uh, in a first reinforced concrete design class. Uh, this table is in the paper when it comes out. You guys should also have access to the slides. Uh, but you know, in terms of topics to consider, uh, we look shear stresses in an uncracked elastic beam, uh, crack initiation and propagation in a concrete beam, uh, concrete contribution, steel contribution, uh, shear analysis and design, uh, and then spacing of stirrups are kind of the big topics to cover um, on shear and reinforced concrete beams. Uh, and as authors, kind of our consensus was the best way uh, to work through uh, this content is to use some different active learning strategies um, to, you know, support our instruction uh, content delivery uh, to match the objectives as well as the available time that we have to increase engagement, reflection and retention um, to promote those different learning styles uh, and also to promote higher order thinking. So just going through some of those activities um, and specifically relating them back to shear. Um, you know, think pair share is one that's been covered uh, a few times throughout these sessions. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time to prepare or do in the classroom. Uh, and, you know, some good examples for shear uh, are to look at the area of shear reinforcement with different stirrup configurations. Uh, this always tends to confuse students. Uh, and so having them think about it, work together and determine how much area of steel you get when you have different configurations of stirrups. Another good one is looking at the strength uh, reduction factor and why it's smaller compared to flexure, so to speak. Uh, in terms of recommendations for this topic, you know, it's always good to make time for the thinking, the pairing and the sharing uh, so that, you know, the entire activity uh, can be conducted uh, and also to vary the groups of students so they don't spend all their time talking about uh, the weekend. Another good one is the muddiest point uh, paper. So, uh, it's again, not very much time to prepare, not very much time to include in the class uh, and provide some really good feedback to help the instructor know if students are struggling. Uh, so, you know, you can have them write down a question uh, that they have about that day's topic, uh, write down a concept from that class uh, that was the most unclear uh, and some good ones for sheer uh, are related to, you know, variable stirrup spacing, maximum V sub U, um, you know, some of those that are more complicated topics. Um, and, you know, we recommend that you, you know, collect these at the end of the class and use them to inform uh, your next class's delivery. Uh, another good one is looking at variations uh, within uh, the content delivery. Uh, again, it doesn't take a lot of time to prepare uh, or do in the class. Uh, and some good examples are um, in terms of an example problem, uh, asking how would this problem change uh, if a specific piece of given information were altered? Uh, or, you know, something like how would changing from a uniform loading to a single point load uh, affect the maximum V sub U? Uh, this helps the students uh, think critically about, you know, how we're approaching an example problem. Uh, it's also a good way to address common mistakes. Uh, if you know there's a point that students tend to have problems with, 
um, you know, looking at a variation that addresses that specific item uh, can really help the students not make that mistake. Uh, so this is an example uh, of, of an example uh, where um, you work through an example problem on shear capacity for a shear reinforced concrete beam, uh, then change the stirrup size uh, and spacing uh, and have the students point out what items within that problem solution would have to change uh, if our conditions were changed. Uh, skeleton notes has been mentioned uh, quite a bit uh, throughout this session. Uh, it does take some time to prepare, uh, but it always takes time to prepare notes the first time, uh, and it can save you a lot of time on the back end. Uh, so it is a really nice method, um, can be adapted to whatever time period in the class uh, that you would really like. Uh, and again, it's just notes that have the key concepts or the, the problem solutions omitted. Um, you fill them in as you work through the class material and it helps keep the students uh, organized. Uh, it's good to focus on providing the items that aren't critical for the students to physically write down. Uh, we're not typically grading them on how well they can draw by hand, uh, but they will spend lots of time on that in class, like what Chris said. Uh, so you can provide, say, a drawing of the end region of a beam uh, and have the students fill in the dimensions, um, you know, developing the equations to calculate capacity, uh, et cetera, uh, potentially having some different cross sections that they can fill in possible stirrup configurations. Uh, but again, you have the difficult parts drawn for them. Um, physical artifacts and demonstrations, uh, you know, have been mentioned over and over again. Um, you can make some of them pretty fast. Some of them take a little more time. Um, you know, the activity time in the classroom varies, uh, but they provide a tangible connection to the material uh, and there are multiple possibilities for shear behavior that I'll show a few examples uh, here, uh, but they're great when you're introducing new concepts, uh, new topics, uh, and you can even distribute them to the, the students like what's been discussed already. Uh, and then, you know, it's nice to give the students a poll at some point in the semester to ask them what, you know, things they would like to have seen as a physical model. Uh, so one that's easy to do is to take a piece of foam, uh, make a shear crack shaped cut uh, through the foam to show them how that crack forms within the beam, uh, and then to use masking tape uh, to reinforce across that crack. Uh, it can be a qualitative description, or you could actually give them some properties of the tape uh, and have them, you know, do a calculation of uh, what capacity that could withstand. Uh, another good one uh, is you can take uh, a piece of um, two by four, two by six, uh, cut a shear crack shaped uh, cut through it, uh, drill a hole through, you probably wanna drill the hole through first, uh, but run uh, a rubber cord through that uh, section where you can load that cracked beam uh, and show strain uh, in the shear reinforcing steel uh, at, at failure. Uh, so another one that's been mentioned a couple times already uh, is related to experiential learning and kind of a, a beam design and testing project. Uh, and, you know, this can take um, a lot of time uh, or you can scale it down to where it doesn't take very much time at all if you run it kind of as a small demonstration. Uh, but students are able to participate in construction and or testing of some physical specimens. Uh, so it does take some time and effort. Uh, also, you know, it takes some funds to do this type of, of testing. Uh, it's best if you already have a lab sec section with the class, uh, but you, again, you can scale it down to something you could do in the class period uh, or in a smaller lab uh, if that's what you have. Uh, so we have a couple of examples in the paper. Uh, one of them is uh, the students are given the design for the beam, uh, specifically related to shear. Uh, you would have an overly large uh, shear reinforcement spacing uh, and potentially a smaller shear reinforcement spacing. Uh, they would build the beam as spec'd out and given to them uh, in one class, and then they would test the beams in another class after the beams had cured. Uh, the second one is, uh, you know, what we've already kind of described in the previous presentation, talking about where the students are assigned a failure type uh, and they have to design their beam to actually achieve that failure type. Uh, so, um, it's been mentioned at least once talking about using spreadsheets uh, or other computational tools um, to promote higher order thinking. Uh, 
Um, you know, it doesn't take a lot of time for us to write an assignment, uh, but it does take the students a lot of time uh, to work through these, and it may take a lot of uh, help from the instructor uh, because, you know, the students may or may not have a lot of experience with the particular program that's being used, uh, but it can streamline the process where they can consider multiple alternatives quickly. Uh, so, you know, you want to be aware of the student's skill level uh, and, you know, provide some resources uh, if they're not, say, familiar with using Excel. Uh, and here's an example of a spreadsheet that's used for determining a variable shear stirrup spacing across the length of the beam. All right, so kind of wrapping up with some lessons learned uh, related to teaching shear. Uh, we say hands on, hands down. Uh, student comments uh, indicate that a laboratory exercise really helps uh, students as well as physical models helping them visualize uh, some of these concepts. Uh, application before theory can be very helpful for shear in terms of you know showing how we apply these equations before deriving them. Um, reinforcement detailing uh, again is a critical point that's already been uh, mentioned in this session uh, but you know looking at uh, the Maximum shear force at a distance D from the end often confuses the students and makes them think they don't need any shear stirrups in that section, which is a very bad thing. Uh, so just making sure that we address um, the, the detailing considerations. Um, know your B, so you know using the web width for shear calculations, never using the flange width, uh, and then beware the fee file up. Uh, there are lots of ways that that can be messed up uh, relative to shear. Uh, and then for assessment, we recommend, you know, homework problems, open-ended projects and exams when we're talking about shear. Uh, so thanks again uh, for, you know, letting me present on this topic. If we have time for questions, I'm happy to, to answer any. Thanks, Royce. We had one question. Uh, how much time do you spend on the ACI minimums and maximums for stirrups contribution? Uh, you know, there's a lot there. How do you balance it? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, and that's one of the ones that um, had a variation or quite a bit of variability in coverage between the, the individual authors of this paper. Uh, I probably spend, you know, a portion of a class period talking through that with students and, you know, hit it up on uh, the example problems. Uh, at least the first one that we do, you know, making sure that we go over whether or not the beam addresses those minimums uh, as well as the maximum spacings. Yeah, my, my answer would be I address it to the extent that's kind of on the FE exam, you know, in their review manual, there's a page. So look at that table. Yeah, that's a good idea too. 